Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Your Legislators. I'm your host, Samantha Sonner. Today we are joined in Santa Fe with Representative Terry McMillan, the representative for District 37. How are you doing today, Representative? Uh, good morning, Samantha. I, uh, actually, uh, my health is good, but I can, uh, I can barely walk because of the after effects of the uh, basketball game last night. Yes, you played in the big House Senate game. So how was the game? Did you win? Well, we didn't, but um, this is a Samantha traditional a game between the members of the House and the Senate. With It's a charity fundraiser, and the proceeds go to UNM Cancer Center. Last night, uh, the game went into double overtime, and um, we lost by a basket. The oh, House lost by a basket. That's disappointing. So it, is. it is, but it was a lot of fun. Well, now, how much money did you guys raise there, too, then? I think about $22,000. Oh, well, that's impressive. So now yes. that we got the fun stuff out of the way here, let's get into some of the more difficult stuff that people are really curious about. Uh, there are two major things that people are paying attention from at the legislature this year. The first one of those is the budget. So where are we at with the budget right now and the negotiations for that? Uh, well, uh, Samantha, it's typical of every legislative session that some of the most important stuff doesn't get done until the last few days. <clears throat> Our budget is not done. Now, uh, on the House side, we always generate the budget in the House of Representatives. And uh, we generated a budget and sent it over to the Senate about a week ago. Now, the problem we're facing, and I think uh, most of uh, the folks in Las Cruces know, that much of our um, budget is, uh, is supplied by oil and gas revenues from uh, royalties and severance taxes that we take from the oil and gas industry. And as you know, oil prices have been so low uh, for most of this year that we're having to work with a much smaller amount of money. And so the truth is we're having to look and see how we can uh, meet our budget and balance our budget with less money than we thought we might have. So we're still in the process of doing that, but we'll have a good conservative budget before, uh, before we're done. Right, so negotiations are going there good. I mean, have you been talking to the Senate or seeing where that, where that budget looks like in the Senate right now? Uh, yes, Samantha, the, the, uh, the financial leaders on both sides, uh, Larry Larinaga on the House side and uh, Senator uh, Smith on the, on the uh, Senate side are uh, in active talks about what more we may need to do uh, to trim the budget or how we're going to meet demands. The most recent projections have even lowered expectations for our upcoming uh, revenues. And so uh, our concern is that, uh, is that we make our budget conservative enough that we do not have to come back in a special session and make cuts faced with, a, with a, an economy that's not good right now. Right now, is this something where it does almost make these budget negotiations a little easier, though, just because there is less money to fight over? Samantha, I want you to ask me that again, please. Is this something where budget negotiations do get a little easier when you have less money just because there is less funds to fight over? No, Samantha, no, it's, it's not. No, it's much, it's much more fun, much more pleasant to try to decide how you're going to spend extra money than it is to decide who's not going to get money that's been getting it. So, no, it's, it's much harder when we have to make budget cuts or have a very conservative budget. And do you think that we are going to get this done with this last six days of the session that we have left so we don't have to go into a special session? Uh, I'm, I'm confident that we will, yes. We have a good leadership, good conservative leadership uh, in this area, and uh, I think uh, we'll have a good budget that we'll get by with without having to have a special session. Okay, that's great. And another thing that people are obviously really concerned about is the Real ID Act. They want to make sure that they have licenses that are able to fulfill everything that you can use a license with. So where is Real ID negotiations right now? Uh, Samantha, I think we're pretty close. And uh, the House of Representatives uh, passed uh, 
a two-tiered uh, bill uh, almost two weeks ago now. We got that bill out uh, after about a week in session and sent it over to the Senate. And uh, in this two-tiered system, uh, New Mexico residents will continue to get uh, real ID compliant driver's licenses and uh, immigrant workers will not get New Mexico driver's license any longer, but they will be issued a driving permit after they've had some background checks. So some of the negotiation that still is going on, as I understand it, has to do with how extensive are those background checks going to be. But uh, my understanding is uh, we're very close, very close. And I think we'll come home with, uh, I think we'll have uh, come home with that problem solved. Right now, this is something where a lot of that fighting is going on is over fingerprints, that they want to collect fingerprints from those immigrant workers who are trying to get that driver's permit cards. And the Senate, that's something that they really don't want to see. Where are you on requiring fingerprints? Oh, I think, uh, I think we want to know if uh, there are any convicted felons that are applying for a driver's permit. I, I think that's uh, common sense. And so <clears throat> I favor doing the background checks by uh, obtaining fingerprints. And uh, an applicant who doesn't uh, have a, uh, a felony record is going to be issued a permit. But I think, we need to, I think we need to screen them. So this is something where you're just looking for criminal records? Because obviously a lot of people are concerned that there might be effects from Department of Homeland Security with immigration issues. I understand that, Samantha. Uh, at, at the same time, um, our job is to serve our constituents, and they need to be able to have a, an ID that clearly distinguishes them uh, from those who are here illegally, so that they can travel about the country and about the state without having to get passports. <coughs> I think it's uh, I, I think it's great that we give those here illegally a permit, and we're not going to become involved in immigration issues per se, but. I do think it's an opportunity to make sure that the, the immigrant community doesn't have convicted felons uh, uh, among it. I don't think we'll find that many, but I think we owe our, uh, our, our con uh, constituents and our citizens uh, that safeguard. Well, it'll be interesting to see <coughs> how that debate plays out over the next couple days. Um, another thing that we have here is that you're a doctor. And that gives you a good insight into some of the healthcare problems in the state right now. And one of those is the shortage of doctors. So as both a doctor and a legislator, how do you see that problem looking right now? Well, this is, Samantha, this is a long-term problem for New Mexico. Um, we have a shortage of all types of providers, not just doctors, but uh, nurse practitioners, uh, every type of uh, primary care practitioner we're short on. And there's a long list of reasons for that, Samantha. Uh, first of all, uh, our economy is not that good. You know, a third of our patients are Medicaid and a third of our patients are Medicare. So um, uh, it's difficult to recruit uh, providers. We also have a pretty difficult tort environment. And it's difficult to recruit providers uh, in, into, a, into a, a, a state where <clears throat> the tort environment is not very good. <coughs> Excuse me. Go ahead, Samantha. Okay, so now I do you have a couple bills that are looking to improve that, and one of those is the osteopathic student loans for service. So if you could talk a little bit about that bill. Well, you know, Samantha, we have a new uh, College of Medicine, Osteopathic Medicine in Las Cruces, and we're <clears throat> very grateful to have it. Of course, one of the things that, uh, that the state legislature's been doing for UNM students for years now is offering them uh, loans for service. And basically what's done is students are advanced loans to help defray the cost of their education. And in return, they agree to serve in some of the underserved areas of New Mexico after they complete their training. So we've been doing that with UNM students for years. And this bill you're uh, alluding to would provide similar scholarships to graduates at Burrell College of Medicine. Right, and I'm sure that would be great for a lot of our rural areas down here in Doniana County that do have that shortage of providers. But how would it impact, you know, Las Cruces? I mean, here we do have a shortage of mental health providers. Could that be considered a shortage for those students to get a loan like that? Uh, yes, if, a, if an osteopathic uh, medical doctor decides to pursue a, a, a degree in training in uh, in uh, mental health <clears throat> or related areas, uh, then absolutely that could apply to them. 
You know, last year we also, I also passed a bill that provided extra educational funding for nurses to pursue advanced degrees. And we now have, uh, we now have uh, nurse practitioners that are specializing in mental health. So, yes, I'm doing quite a bit about trying to recruit physicians to our area. Okay, great. And so you have, obviously, you are a doctor, so you have a number of other bills aimed at the healthcare and medical industry. Another one of those is ensuring out-of-state healthcare provider access. What does this bill do exactly? Well, I want to apologize, Samantha, for my voice. I'm recovering from a cold. But uh, our state appeals court has recently made a novel ruling, and that ruling is that New Mexicans who travel out of state to get health care, and in our area that means uh, El Paso and Texas, but New Mexico patients can sue providers out of state in our court system. And uh, I, I find this to be a very bad development for access to care for New Mexicans. It would mean that physicians in El Paso and other areas where we may go to get care uh, would have to buy a more or a separate additional malpractice insurance policy in order to be covered and I'm afraid many of them are not going to do that. So my bill would place in statute that New Mexico residents if they need to take action against a health care provider that they see out of state will need to uh, sue them in that state <coughs> in New Mexico. We will lose access to health care provision in El Paso and, and in Texas in general if we don't pass this bill. Right now, is this something where this is harmful for constituents who might be in Las Cruces, who it would be too expensive to sue someone out of state, but they could do it more locally? Is this going to create any problems for New Mexicans? Uh, Samantha, yes, as I've just said, we refer patients out of Las Cruces for specialty care and out of the state, <clears throat> and we refer them, our trauma patients, to uh, Del Sol Hospital the uh, level one trauma center down there, and many of our uh, southern New Mexicans choose to go to El Paso for health care. Now those doctors are gonna want, uh, not going to want to have to buy a, or purchase a separate medical malpractice policy in order to, to see uh, us from southern New Mexico. It threatens access to care, Samantha. It's not a matter of cost, it's access. Okay, great. So now you have another kind of health bill that's aimed more at education, and this is providing a life-saving skills training in middle schools and high schools. So if you could talk about that for a little bit. Well, thank you very much, Samantha. This is a great bill, and the truth is it's going to save lives, and it'll start saving lives next year. Um, <clears throat> we're going to require that health classes in our public schools uh, teach uh, some basic life-saving skills to include compression only CPR, uh, use of the uh, automated external defibrillator, and uh, Heimlich maneuver. Uh, so once this is in place, New Mexico will have an additional 50,000 people every year trained in administering these uh, very critical emergency services. The bill also includes uh, protections against liability so that patients who render, I mean persons who render help to uh, someone who has suddenly uh, become unresponsive uh, cannot basically be sued for any reason. So we, we're going to train these people and then we're going to make sure that they feel comfortable doing it. Uh, this bill is going to save lives and it's, it's going to get through the legislature. Right, so this is something where you are training the 7th and ninth grade students in the schools. Is this going to put any additional cost on the educational system? No, this, uh, this uh, bill flows out of a, a project that's already uh, I existent, uh, um, Heart Start, which is a project uh, in Albuquerque. Dr. Barry Ramo, the cardiologist in Albuquerque, started this project. So they've been training school, school kids for several years now on a voluntary basis. And they've trained many thousands of kids how to render these uh, critical services in an emergency, and it's very successful. So all of the materials, uh, the training dummies, the training materials, and the expertise are going to be provided free.
Okay, great. So this is just some free additional training for our students here in the state. Um, you're also getting a lot of support down here for your bill to create a neurodegenerative disease registry. I know Doniana County this week passed a resolution in support of that registry. Could you explain what that registry would do? Well, uh, yes, Samantha, basically uh, we would like to be able uh, to um, track patients in New Mexico who develop a neurodegenerative disease, including Parkinson's. What that means is uh, when the diagnosis is made and the location and some of the basic information on the patients is collected by the Department of Health. And over a period of time, <clears throat> what we hope to do is to f try to find patterns as to where these diseases tend to arise, and, and we try to find causal patterns. <coughs> so that on the long run, uh, we can make some uh, determinations as to uh, the causing, causal factors of some of these diseases. So we hope to get that project funded. Okay, so this is something where those diseases include Parkinson's as well as dementia and Alzheimer's. Is this something where if you're diagnosed with one of these diseases, you're going to be automatically put on this registry or can people opt out of having their names? You know, I know there's a lot of people who just don't like the government to have their information. Well, I think obviously and uh, actually, yes, they'll be able to opt out of participation. Okay, great. So now we have another huge problem in this state and that is heroin and opioid addiction. We are one of the highest states with rates for heroin and opioid addiction. And you have a bill this session to kind of address opioid overdose. If you could talk about that for a little bit. Again, Samantha, you've done your homework, yes. Um, we have a huge uh, uh, and, and rising rate of, um, of uh, overdose from uh, prescription opiates. I'm sorry about my voice. No problem. <clears throat> but my bill would uh, allow for wide distribution of the opiate antagonist naloxone. And what we'd like to do is have the uh, antagonist distributed widely to people who are required to take opiates to their family members, to the police department, to various uh, agencies and programs so that uh, it can be administered when we encounter someone who may have had an overdose. The effects are immediate. <clears throat> when someone has an opiate overdose, they stop breathing. If you administer naloxone uh, quickly, the response is like in one minute, Samantha, and lives will be saved when we distribute naloxone, naloxone throughout the community. It's very safe, it can't be abused, and it's easy to administer. So I think this is a very direct way to save lives in New Mexico in terms of patients that have overdosed uh, from opiates, opiates. Now this is something naloxone, it's also called Narcan for people who may be more used to that term for it. Um, is this something where a lot of opponents to having wider access to naloxone or Narcan feel that it actually encourages heroin and opioid abuse because people know that they can just be restarted very quickly. Is that something that you see as a doctor? I'm sorry, Samantha, that, uh, that's absurd notion. Uh, patients who use opiates for pain or even those uh, persons who abuse these drugs never want to be administered naloxone. It reverses all the effects of the drugs immediately. So this is not something that will stimulate use of opioids in any way whatsoever. But it will save lives of those who have overdosed. Right now this is, I actually went to a heroin and opioid abuse summit here in Las Cruces a little while ago. And one of the people there who I spoke with was talking about a kind of opioid that couldn't be abused. It couldn't be crushed, which makes it easier to abuse. And this is something that right now it's not covered by insurance providers. Is this something where you wanna look into that or is this something where the legislature should be looking into that? Uh, thank you, Samantha. There is a bill in the legislature now that would require uh, uh, health care payers, uh, health insurance, to provide some opiate uh, resist or abuse resistant opiates for treatment of chronic pain. And there's pros and cons uh, about this type of uh, medication. Generally, I think that's a good idea. In other words, there are variety. <coughs> Excuse 
There are varieties of pain medication pills which are crush resistant and therefore uh, very difficult to abuse other than simply swallowing the pill which is what is supposed to be done. The problem with them at this point is they're quite expensive still and there's no generic variety. So we are considering that legislation in the legislature and it is making its way through um, and we're vetting that. The, the, the balance is between the benefits and, and, uh, uh, of the medication as opposed to the costs. But that legislation is, is, is in the legislature. Okay, so it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. One of the most talked about bills that you have in the legislature right now is actually creating a salary for state legislators. So if you could talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, I thank you for that, Samantha. And again, I apologize uh, <clears throat> for my voice and difficulties here, but uh, <clears throat> we always get the, uh, a cold when we come to the Capitol. It's a closed environment and we get sick every year. But, um, you know, <clears throat> there are some things that should be noted about the legislature. And once you've been here uh, a little while, you begin to see some of the problems inherent in our legislature. We have, uh, we have a volunteer legislature. Now, we refer to it as a citizen legislature. Uh, but that's not accurate. It, it's a volunteer legislature. And, and, and there's three problems with it. Uh, first of all, uh, whenever we expect performance from people, we pay them. Um, as soon as a community grows to a, a, a size adequate uh, to have the resources, we start paying our firemen. We start paying our policemen. We pay our teachers. We pay our health care workers. And we expect in return a level of reliability and performance uh, <clears throat> that we don't expect from volunteers. Um, number two, uh, Samantha, um, the, the legislators here are all people who can afford to be here. Because we're not paid, uh, we depend on revenue streams uh, from, our, from our work, from our retirement, or from our spouse at home uh, pulling the load. <clears throat> So we all bring with us uh, a dependency on an outside source of revenue. What that means is that, that there can be a, a degree of compromise um, and uh, interest that we might uh, um, unconsciously want to protect. And finally, the most important reason is this. I would estimate that 85 to 90 percent of all New Mexicans cannot participate in the legislature because they can't afford it. Because there's no pay, uh, um, and most New Mexicans cannot afford to run for the legislature, and it has the effect of a poll tax on the participation in this process. So uh, we have an antiquated system, and uh, we, uh, our citizens could expect better performance and wider participation, and that would require paying them. Um, now, the bill that I've introduced would not pay legislators until five years out from now, which means that most of us would have to go through two or three election cycles to realize that pay. So I think that's a measure of how serious uh, uh, I am about this. It's not about paying ourselves, but it is about improving the reliability of our legislature. Right, but this is something where reports have come out this year that New Mexico legislators are pretty well compensated. They do receive about $20,000 a year on average in compensation. Are you saying that compensation isn't enough to keep people in the legislature? Uh, uh, Samantha, I need to correct a misconception. Uh, New Mexico legislators get a per diem, which is an estimated amount per day when, when we're at work in the session or in interim committees which is an estimated amount to cover our expenses for staying, traveling, and eating. <clears throat> and so we are remunerated what comes out of our pocket in order to participate. That's not pay. Um, and there's been some recent publicity about some of the members that have uh, uh, collected quite a lot of per diem. And I think the truth is that uh, we need to reform our interim committee system because I think uh, I think there's uh, 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 I think there's clearly some inefficiencies and some uh, 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 representatives who are attending interim committees, representatives and senators who aren't actually members of the committee. So uh, that's wasteful. But per diem is not pay. It's a it, it is a uh, it, it is an amount to to. Uh, uh, help pay our expenses. We do incur expenses, of course, when we come to Santa Fe or travel around the state to do the state's business. So this is something to cover expenses. It's not pay. Is this something where if, you, if this 
salary bill does pass, will we see that per diem pay then stop and go away, or are you still going to get that form of compensation? No, I wouldn't expect the per diem to go away, but I do expect that uh, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would like to see a reform of our interim committee system uh, so that uh, we, we make the committee smaller and only a, a committee members can attend the interim committee meetings. Uh, and this will save a lot of money. Once the legislators are salaried, they'll pretty much be expected to attend uh, interim committee meetings because they are salaried. A stipend to cover expenses, I think, should continue, but I think, uh, I think, uh, I think it's uh, used too much. And I think we need to curtail interim activities. Okay, great. So we have just a couple minutes left here, but do you think that this is something where if you do see that salary, we also need to do some kind of campaign finance reform? <clears throat> Samantha, that's an unrelated issue, uh, uh, but I do see the similarity in thinking. Um, now, I'm not going to go to campaign finance reform until we get this done first. So, uh, and this is going to be a long uphill climb. Uh, legislators are afraid to vote for a bill that might uh, make them look bad, and uh, so I don't expect this bill to get out, but I think we need to have the discussions, and that's the reason I brought them, but uh, campaign finance reform is another issue. Okay, so we have just a couple seconds left here. Uh, there might be some people watching this who have more questions for you. How would they be able to get in touch with you up in Santa Fe? Well, they can email me. My email is docmcmillan at gmail.com. That's D-O-C-M-C-M-I-L-L-A-N at gmail.com. Or they can call me 575-635-0534. So I apologize again for my voice issues, Samantha, but it's been a pleasure. Yes, you know, it's cold season. I think everyone understands, Representative. And thank you for joining us from Santa Fe. And thank you for watching your legislators.